Okay. We're going to get started here on the, uh, in a second on the session called The Enterprise is Everywhere. Uh, but first of all, one of the sponsors of Renaissance this year is Apogee. And people have been asking us since the session yesterday, what exactly does Apogee do? How, tell us more about Apogee. So Tim Engelay from Apogee is here to give a little one minute talk about exactly what does Apogee do? What can they do for you? All right. How are we doing? Good? Good time? Learning a lot? Yeah. I am. So. Good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're very happy to be sponsored this year uh, of, of Renaissance IO, a uh, really cool conference. And um, what does Apigee do exactly? So we do three things. Um, if you don't have an app, if you're building one app right now, we have a line of like backend services that let you very easily store users, uh, store data, store files, uh, add social features, add geolocation features, stuff like that. Uh, and that's app services, little purple thing on the, on the right over there, on my, you know, your, your left, my right. Um, if you already have an app, what's an app right now already? No? Nobody has an app? Yeah, okay, some people have an app. Uh, you can very easily add, or Mobile Analytics SDK. You just drop it in your app, and immediately you're going to get real-time information about who's using your app, when is it crashing, why, even system-level crashes. It's going to give you network performance indicator to tell you why your app is feeling slow to users and why you're getting bad ratings on the App Store. And it's going to let you push live changes to your app without going through the App Store again. Finally, the third thing we do, blue one, and the one you know, arguably we've been most famous for uh, historically, is uh, gateway services. So if you work for a very large corporation or you work for a client, you know, that's, that's a very large corporation, uh, this lets you very easily build, expose, and uh, scale an API for legacy systems. So if you're dealing with like an old COBOL code base, some Oracle database somewhere, and you need to grab that data to plug into your mobile app, this lets you do it very easily and very scalable, uh, in a very scalable way. So this is used by you know, tons of large corporations like you know, AT&T, Walgreens, Best Buy, Bechtel, tons of really large companies doing this. So that's the three things we do. Uh, it's all free for developers forever. Why? Because we basically sell this to very large corporations for like six, seven figure deals. So we don't go after developers for $20 a year or $100 a year, right? So it's always free for developers to use. And you can go sign up for free at appy.com right now. And if you sign up later in front of me, I'll even give you an O'Reilly book at the table right across the door. So if you have any questions, uh, come see me. And thanks again. Happy to be here. Happy to sponsor Renaissance IO. Have fun. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> so the idea behind this panel is that um, what we're seeing, especially on mobile, especially on iOS, is that enterprise and non-enterprise consumer development it's kind of converging. People get their apps through one place now. It's all in the App Store. Expectations are sort of merging between what is an enterprise app and experience and what is a consumer app and experience. Um, Enterprise-grade tools from new startups are becoming available to us as developers. Um, new business models are evolving on mobile that are kind of enterprise-y but weren't possible before. So to consider various aspects of, of the enterprise app question, we have a panel of five people here. Uh, in order, I believe they're in order, there is uh, Brent Simmons from Scipio Labs, uh, Ty Amel from uh, uh, StackMob, so he's founder and CEO of StackMob, um, and Brent Simmons is a co-founder. Mar Hershenson, founder and CEO of Revel Touch. Uh, Ilya Sukar, is that how you say it? Uh, CEO of Parse. And finally, uh, Joe Pizzillo, the co-founder of Push.io. And so each one has a presentation we'll do first, and then we'll, uh, in the remaining period, we'll take some Q&A. And again, tweet your uh, questions to the hashtag, if you can, during the ongoing talks. That worked pretty well yesterday. Um, and with that, I think we'll just throw right over to uh, Brent. Cool. Me? Does this work? It works. Awesome. Do you have a clicker thing? Or? This one should work. Yeah, all right. Let me switch it. So uh, I'm curious, first, how many people are doing any kind of enterprise work? Like, uh, a fair amount. That's not bad. So you've learned maybe uh, the really important thing about enterprise software. Well, there are two important things. One is that it can be kind of boring, um, but there's a lot of money. And I think that's the most, most important reason to care about enterprise software, is that businesses have money. And money lets you do cool things like pay your bills. Anyway, so I write an, write an app called Glassboard, which is a, a private group messaging app. Um, and its main use is uh, for small groups of people to communicate with each other, to coordinate or, or whatever. It's kind of like uh, having your own little mini private Twitter. And I think of it as enterprise software in disguise as consumer software, because we've developed the app and 
released it the way you would almost any other uh, consumer app. So I'll tell you about how I got to that point and why I'm doing that. So in 2003, uh, I had an app called Net Newswire that was doing very well. It was a RSS reader with a weblog editor component. And I was thinking about what else could I do? How could I reuse my code? How could I you know, do other interesting things you know, along the same lines? So I had an idea for an app called Inside Story. I never wrote it, uh, but the idea was that within, um, within a single business, you would use, uh, then it was called Rendezvous, now it's called Bonjour Networking, and everybody would run this little app and you'd be able to post stuff that all of your coworkers could see. And you know, they could read what you write, um, you could read what they write. And it wouldn't require any kind of server installation or anything because it would all be done within the context of the app. And this was well before you know, Twitter or Facebook or Yammer or Jive or, or anything like that. And since my other app was already doing well, I didn't actually pursue this idea, but I think the main reason I didn't was because I did, did not think that I knew how to sell software to businesses. And I think that's actually still true. I don't know how to sell software to businesses. So I was acquired uh, by a company called NewsGator in 2005. Uh, they hired me and they bought NetNewsWire, my RSS reader. And NewsGator was very much focused on RSS. They called themselves the RSS company. They don't call themselves that anymore. Um, and they don't have my newsreader anymore either. Um, in fact, is Daniel Pasco in the room anywhere? Other Black Pixel people? All right, they're out of here. Anyway. Um, so what NewsGator was doing was they were creating a behind the firewall um, enterprise RSS reading system. So. This was in the years before Google Reader, but if you picture something like Google Reader only behind the firewall, uh, that's what they made, and they sold that to companies. And in order to make that very interesting, they added um, sharing stuff and like just a little bit of social networking to go along with the RSS reading. And what they discovered was that nobody really cared about the feeds. What made the system interesting was actually the communication and, and the sharing between coworkers. So they essentially got rid of the feed reading component and just kept the sharing. And that turned into an app uh, called Social Sites, which is um, uh, a SharePoint plugin that they sell to big Fortune 500 type companies. And it's, it's one of those kind of huge pieces of software with a you know, bazillion different ways to configure it. And the IT department and everybody are all very much involved in getting it set up and running. And NewsGator has salespeople and pre-sales engineers and you know all this stuff, all this infrastructure to sell this kind of heavyweight enterprise solution. Uh, but then a couple years ago, um, some people I, I worked with at NewsGator, um, some people that worked on consumer apps with me, thought, well, what if we did something kind of like social sites, but that doesn't require you know the IT department and stuff to get involved? What if we wrote something that was essentially consumer software, but that solved the same problem of you want to coordinate and, and share stuff and talk with small groups of people. So we wrote Glassboard. Glassboard. And our approach was absolutely, you know, treat it like a, a consumer app. Um, make it a lot simpler. Make it not require, you know, SharePoint or some crazy server. So we had to write our own back end and all that kind of stuff. And um, Simplification and focus was uh, a big part of, of what we did there because social sites, probably no one in here has seen it, but it is the farthest thing from simple that I can imagine. Uh, yet it makes a lot of money. So. so one of the big things that we had to deal with in making this software was privacy and trust. So we took um, a couple technical approaches to that. One is that the app requires SSL. It, it doesn't. It, doesn't work any other way. Uh, another thing that we did was make sure that the database on, on, on our back end is completely encrypted so that we have no easy way to see what people are doing. In fact, we don't even know who uses our software unless they tell us. And we certainly have no idea what people are posting or talking about or, any, or anything. Um, so that was very important in order to get businesses to, to trust us. But I think the, the smartest thing that we did 
was to make sure that there are zero settings for privacy. And the cool thing about that is if there are no privacy settings, then everything's private and there's nothing that you can accidentally configure wrong, right? And I think that helps with the, with the trust an awful lot. So the next thing we need to do is figure out how to make money, which is still a work in progress. Since we're not doing the traditional enterprise route, we don't have you know, sales guys going out and selling this to companies. So what we have is a, a free app, and it's free because with a social app, the value comes from having other people on it, and if it was a dollar or ten dollars, it's hard to convince all your coworkers and your Uncle Joe and everybody to actually get the app. So we made it a free app, and we have a premium level of features that you can, uh, that you can subscribe to. And we haven't done in-app purchasing yet, but uh, that's kind of the you know, next obvious big step for us. And hopefully that'll bring in some good money. Uh, another thing we've thought about doing, though it hasn't come up yet, is site licenses for companies that want to use it. So we could um, do a special build, uh, help them get set up with in-house enterprise distribution and so on. Um, the idea has come up of, you know, doing like very custom builds, you know, the company wants their own color scheme or they want to rename the app or something crazy. And we're really against that because we really do want to make consumer level software. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole of, you know, doing, just doing stuff that, that companies are asking for. But money is money. So if somebody, you know, says, well, we'll give you a whole lot of money if you would make that green instead of blue, we'd probably say, okay, green's fine. We like green. <laughs> and I think that's it. Yeah, I'm done. Cool. <laughs> Next up is uh, Ty. On. There we go. Um, so I'm Ty Amel. I'm founder and CEO of, of StackMob. Um, I'm going to take two minutes and tell you a little bit about StackMob so you might actually believe some of the things I'm saying up here. Um, it won't be all lies. Some of them might, might be lies. Um, mostly just talking about trends and, and where we see the enterprise going um, and the opportunity for any developers in the enterprise space. Um, I tried to tailor this more towards you guys, um, not talking necessarily about all the great things enterprises are doing, but how they're building APIs and how it's becoming a great monetization um, opportunity for any developers. Uh, but StackMob was the original backend as a service. Uh, we started the industry in January of 2010. We've been around for just over three years. Uh, we make it incredibly easy to build out your API. Uh, we've also continued to change the industry by, on November 13th, announcing that the core API is completely free. Um, so you don't pay on API tra transactions, you don't pay on users. Uh, we're all about the services that you actually use, um, and that's how we monetize. Uh, we're big believers in the transferring of bits is getting towards zero. Uh, we're very good at making APIs, we're very efficient with it. It doesn't cost us much, we shouldn't penalize you for success. Um, so we launched the StackMob Marketplace, which has modules from StackMob, but it also has brought in industry uh, leaders like SendGrid and Urban Airship and PubNub, um, and some you might not think of, like user voice for user management within the iOS applications. Um, the result from that has been amazing. Uh, we work with everybody from small indie developers to a lot of agencies and app dev shops working with enterprise, and then we work a lot with uh, enterprise directly. But today, I'm here to talk about enterprise APIs. Um, it's not just the cool guys anymore. Um, it's not just the people that you're used to with Facebook and Twitter. Um, all these people are making APIs, but Netgear. Um, who thinks of APIs when I say Netgear? Exactly. Um, to be honest, until about six months ago, I didn't know they were really still around. Um, I knew they're Netgear routers, um, but I kind of assumed they got bought by somebody else. Um, but they are making a big play into APIs and home automation, uh, where pretty much my understanding of it is the router becomes the gateway, um, and then you can interact with every device through that router. Um, that is Netgear. You could put software on the device, 
um, there's portal servers that talk to an API through it, and you can do a lot of very, very interesting things. Um, and as we all know, home, home automation is a big thing um, and a big trend that we're starting to see. Uh, DMB. Um, DMB has the most information on every single person in this room and every single company um, in the world. And they are exposing that through APIs. A little scary, but there's a wealth of information. Um, every developer that I know, when they're told they get access to a wealth of data, they get very excited. Um, Netflix got their algorithm um, fixed by indie developers because they gave access to more data than anyone had ever given indie developers before. Um, so DMB is kind of doing that same thing. So there's a lot of opportunity there from DMB. And then AT&T, Verizon, all the telcos, um, they're trying to expose more APIs. They're trying to build a developer ecosystem. Everyone in this room is incredibly valuable to any telco. They all want you, and they all want you to build apps for them. Um, so when you're thinking about the enterprise and what ability you have, realize you, you have the upper hand. These are huge corporations, but they're dying, literally dying, to get you onto their platforms. So APIs are really the new open source. Um, I stole that. I don't remember who I stole it from. If it was anybody in this room, I apologize. Um, but I thought it was great. Um, it's really the way that we're sharing information now. Um, it used to be by open source and code, still is, but these bigger enterprise, they can expose their information and their data to you through their APIs, and that's their way of, of open source. And we're seeing that as more and more of a trend of enterprise are realizing they need to stay more connected uh, to the developers and exposing it through um, APIs. And then I talked about this already, but just the wealth of data information you have. Um, think about all the data that these huge corporations have and interesting things you could do with it. Hopefully it's slightly anonymous. Um, I don't want you to know what I buy on Amazon, um, but you can do very interesting things with it. Um, and it's really creating this network connected world. Um, we talk about that a lot at Stack Mob, and I'll, I'll talk about it more. Um, but we're entering this world where it's an internet of things or whatever you want to call it, but all devices are talking to every single other device, and it is going to be people in this room that bring it all together and bring these devices together. So in 2013, 2012, we definitely have the connected consumer. Mobile was really the first true personal mass media device. It's always with us. But mobile doesn't mean just my cell phone anymore. It's cell phones, tablets, cars, TVs. It's everything that we're connected. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has a TV that can connect to the internet, um, or you have one at work. So you have this connected consumer. We are always able to get online. And people in developing countries are getting online for the first time through these devices. And now you have the connected enterprise, where the enterprise's goal is to connect their machines to their consumers. Um, I know it sounds a little scary, but I swear they're not actually trying to hook you up to the computer. They just want to know where you are, what you're doing, and how you're interacting with their products. So that creates the connected enterprise, where consumers, employees are connected to machines. And that leads us to the connected world, of when we as developers intersect this connected world and connected enterprise, connected consumer and connected enterprise, we can bring it all together and create this true connected world where devices are talking to devices, home automation, and you start to get to this world of what some people call ambient intelligence. Um, and I did steal this graphic, and I know who I stole it from. You just can't read it down here. But um, this was the best way I've ever seen uh, in, ambient intelligence um, put up into a graphic. And basically what an ambient intelligence is, is the apps and the devices move to the background. Um, the devices are here, there's gonna be 15 billion by 2015 or whatever the new number is. Um, but as apps start to progress, you'll start interacting with them in a more natural way. Um, and that is through gestures or biometrics um, instead of having to pull out your phone and, and, and use your fingers. Um, and it's human-centered. So it's all about me as a human and all my devices around me. 
And then the devices start to become, I don't want to use the word aware because I don't want any terminators, but <laughs> they become better at location and context awareness and understanding what you're doing. Um, the color app, everyone in this room probably knows, pretty epic failure, but from a technology standpoint, it was really interesting. It would pull up um, the microphone and see whether you're in a noisy place or a quiet place. It would open up the camera and see whether it was dark or light outs. Um, it was very, very aware of your surroundings. The company didn't do well, but the product was actually pretty amazing. Um, and as we get closer and closer to that, we become into this ambient intelligence world. So after all of that, why do we care? Uh, why do people in this room care? We have more data than ever. And you know, yes, there's probably a monetization opportunity, but it's also just really freaking cool. Um, it's so much information that we can play with. Um, and as a developer, I always like more data and more information. Enterprise can be consumer. Brent talked about this. Um, but it's becoming less and less what we consider traditional enterprise. Um, and it's moving into more of the consumer world. So you have an opportunity to engage the enterprise from a c consumer perspective. Um, devices are here. Um, everybody has an iPhone in here, I bet, uh, considering it's an iOS conference. You have more power in your hand than, went to, than the rocket that went to the moon. So the devices are here. It's really the app's time to innovate. And, and that's what all these connected world and APIs are allowing you to do. It's building something that we haven't seen. And people always ask me, well, what is that? I don't know. If I knew, I'd build it. Um, I'm trying to enable the smarter people in the room to actually build that. Um, and then it's only a beginning. Um, people always say, well, hey, it's, it's, it's mobile, it's iOS. Aren't they getting beats? Um, isn't it kind of, kind of plateaued? Um, let's see here. It's 2013. So the iPhone's been around for, what, six years? Uh, App Store's been around for five, give or take. Um, it's only the beginning. Don't let anybody tell you that uh, mobile's kind of plateaued or you guys have seen the best that's going to come. Um, this enterprise wave of enabling APIs and giving you guys more data and more information is really going to change um, how we see the world and how we see apps. So that's my big trend. Um, and I believe that's it. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mara Hershenson, and I have to start with a disclaimer. I'm not an iOS developer. In fact, I was designing uh, chips that went into phones for just two years ago, and I was doing that for 15 years. So I don't have a ton of iOS developer experience, but um, I fell in love uh, with iOS and with the iPad and iPhone, and I decided to start a company that was our you know, had to do with iOS. I should also say that I've been selling to enterprise for 15 years. So what I thought I would do in this talk is tell you about my company and also tell you how we are solving a problem for these enterprises and how we are um, managing to get some money out of them. Okay. So I think it's a little blurry, but or else my uh, glasses are dirty. Uh, but hopefully you can read it. Uh, we sell um, to companies a platform where they can create this shopping apps and they're more you know when you hear of shopping apps you're probably thinking of going onto a website like Amazon or whatever your favorite shopping and it's kind of boring and you're browsing through a bunch of um, products in an organized fashion but uh, what these apps allow you to do is actually create a different uh, shopping experience and that's what we allow our customers to do um, just very quickly I'll tell you that we sell to major luxury brands and home, fashion, and also to media companies. So the company's about 18 months old, and we have really good brands as customers. Um, so I'm going to start uh, my talk with why apps, and why tablets, and why a platform, and what can the retailers do with what we do, and um, what will they do? So why apps? That's a big question. Um, this is who is our customer, is the CMO. So we sell to this 
very powerful person at companies that they manage the marketing and they manage um, all their digital strategies sometimes and they manage e-commerce. And their most important thing is their brand. So this, um, they're, they're very careful about how they present their brand. Otherwise, this is a very expensive bag for, um, may, maybe some of you don't know, but it's very expensive. It costs thousands of dollars. And the only reason you're willing to pay thousands of dollars for that bag is because somebody has spent a lot of time managing their brand. And they care about every <coughs> pixel. They care about every store, et cetera. But they have a huge issue when it comes online. It's very challenging for them. It almost um, you know, makes uh, brands lose their identity. If you compare, this is just to show two websites that sell shoes. Even now when it's blurry, it's even worse. Um, but one of them sells shoes that cost $2,000, and the other one sells shoes that cost $100. So if you're the CMO and you really want people to pay $2,000, you have a very tough time when you put these websites together, if you put the branding, you see, when it's Prada. Um, but these guys are trying hard to figure out their website. And then they realize, oh my goodness, my audience is moving um, very fast to mobile. Even, two, you know, even less than two years ago when we started our company, we would go to these enterprises, to the CMOs, and say, you really should be doing something about mobile and iPads and they'd be like, are you sure they're here to stay? So, you know, even today we find people like that. So it's shocking, obviously, to everybody in this room, but it's, it's definitely true. So they, um, you know, that's what they're seeing. So they find us and they always ask me this question, uh, why should I do an app? Shouldn't I just make my website better? In fact, I've spent all this money and they have, in some cases, the companies we have, we work with, will have 200 people managing their e-commerce sites and operations, et cetera. So um, it's a tough, uh, you know, and it's almost like a religion when you walk into some of these companies. Somebody is, uh, you know, is in the HTML5 religion camp, and somebody's in the iOS religion camp, and there's nothing you can do. But um, this is how to, what has worked for us. I will say, okay, you are Prada. And um, you want to get give the best experience to your customer. If you want to give this amazing shopping experience, what can you do it? How can you do it better? Can you do it better with a native app, or would you do it better on HTML5 app? And I think, obviously, it's a friendly audience, but um, it's clear that it's going to feel clunky when you're uh, doing it on HTML5, and it feels slick when you're doing a native app. So. If you're uh, Prada or Louis Vuitton or any of these people and you care about your brand, I think the answer is clear for them. So in a way, I tell them, you know, you have your assets and you can either print them on, you know, regular paper or you can print them on this beautiful paper like your wedding invitation. And in fact, these people already do that when they are, um, you know, printing catalogs. They will print really expensive paper or cheap paper. And it really uh, depends on who you're trying to to reach, it doesn't, you know, if you care about your brand, you'll uh, pay the price for it. So um, that's what we do. Um, I have a video, I'm gonna skip it in the interest of time, but I'll tell you why iPad, and uh, this is another statistic that really matters. P iPads, um, you know, we, as a small startup, we had to choose one way or another, and we decided to focus on iPads, uh, maybe because I was using it all the time. But the truth is that the numbers that come out on e-commerce for iPad are ridiculous. Um, even, um, even this data is about nine months old, so you know, data gets old very fast. But 64% of the e-commerce uh, visits on a mobile device happen on an iPad. But in terms of transactions, 89% are happening on an iPad. So that's where people are actually shopping. They're not really shopping on an iPhone. Um, they're shopping on an iPad. I mean, this is iPad. It's iDevices. It's not even Android devices. So um, the statistics still valid. I think it went from 89 to 86 or 87 over the holiday. So still very strong uh, on the i. I'm going to skip this. Um, so why did we create a platform? Uh, we created a platform, and that's really what we sell for the merchants. The merchants are not developers either, so we don't sell APIs or SDKs. We sell them really a piece of software that feels more like an InDesign software and allows them to drag and drop and kind of create this app. So, um, you know, it's very specific for e-commerce and it's very specific in the sense that, um, I think this is the laser, we 
need to integrate with a bunch of their e-commerce systems. And their e-commerce systems are typically so old that they don't even have APIs to access their data. So um, that's one of the things we end up doing. We obviously integrate with their creative, uh, also with a bunch of data. E-commerce, as you probably know, is very, e is very data driven. People know what you bought before, how people buy, et cetera. So all the decisions in our apps, like where to put icons or what colors or what products to show, et cetera, end up being data driven. Okay, and this is just uh, um, more information on that. Um, okay, so what can the CMO do? This is another important, if you're doing apps, um, you will, in e-commerce, we measure success based on how long people stay with an app or um, engagement or how much do they shop on the app, the average or, or their value, how much do they convert, et cetera. And all the numbers are actually better with an app. And eBay has published a lot of that information, so if you're interested and you're making shopping apps, um, you can go see it, won't go into that detail. Um, but what the CMO does is they'll actually do full e-commerce replacements. They'll also do interactive catalogs. So um, very neat. think of the catalog of the future if you could do it as an app, which is really great. Um, they also will do little design boards and social shopping intent things. So you can, they, this is very interesting. They'll do what they call stunt apps. So you know, di right now they'll have an app for Christmas or they'll have an app for Fashion Week or they'll have an app that lasts one day or two days. So they need a way to create these apps really, really quickly. And it's almost part of their marketing campaign if you're launching a new perfume or whatever. Um, you used to pay print ads or print catalogs and now people are thinking, oh, maybe we should have like this mobile marketing um, expense. And it's interesting to see how they're changing. And finally, and this is very interesting, they're also putting all these devices in store. And I do believe this is the beginning, um, obviously, Everybody knows about these POS systems, but they're using them more as sales associate uh, guides and as CRMs, so um, there's also uh, work on that. Anyway, so just some parting thoughts. Obviously, the audience is, create, is more mobile. I think uh, e-commerce and in-store and retail um, is just a bound of opportunity for people like here in the audience, so I think that's Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Ilya, and I am the co-founder and CEO of a company called Parse. And uh, today I'll do a quick introduction about what Parse is all about, and then I'll give you some sense of what trends we've seen in the enterprise space, uh, the kinds of enterprise apps we've seen, and how they break down in terms of requirements, in terms of who's building them, and, and uh, you know what features they're using and such. Uh, so what is Parse? Parse is a better way to build mobile apps. Uh, we make it dead simple to uh, do things like store data, uh, do push notifications, uh, drop identity into your uh, app, and do all of the various business logic things that you need for uh, most mobile applications. The idea is to bring all the table stakes functionality to a platform so that you can focus on the important stuff, the UI layer, the engagement of your app, getting it to achieve the business goals that you want it to achieve, and not focusing on uh, the stuff that most people reinvent the wheel on, you know, things like, um, storing data, syncing it between devices, uh, dealing with a database, dealing with indexing, going from you know server to client, dealing with differences in uh, Android uh, devices, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so Parse Data is our uh, data offering there. We make it dead simple to drop uh, an SDK either into Xcode for iOS, into Eclipse for Android, Windows Phone, God bless you if you're using it right now. Uh, <laughs> Um, all the platforms that you could possibly imagine, HTML5 and JavaScript, um, REST API, you, you know, whatever you can imagine, we have an interface for it. And so what you get out of the box is just basically an ORM in your client. Um, so you as a client developer can focus on just dealing with your native environment, whether it's you know, Objective-C or Java, you deal with objects that look like local objects. And in the end, they're actually backed by a database. We do all the indexing for you. We do all the scaling for you. We do all the serialization for you. If you have a scenario where you're doing things uh, you know, offline, we'll take care of all that for you. 
we also give you this nice looking data browser which is useful for both the technical people on your team to just see what's going on in the app but also for non-technical people so you can imagine if you're building games your game producer who might not know how to write sql wants to tweak the price of cows to you know extract more money from thirteen year olds whatever it may be they can do that without getting in touch with you or without you having to build a custom cms for them if you have a content app you might be inserting content into your system through the data browser you might have interns doing you know content moderation whatever it may be we want to make it much easier for you to deal with your data so we also do all sorts of stuff around push push is basically the email marketing of the next generation so we give you a layer on top of all of the various push platforms ios android different flavors of android whether it's google or kindle windows as well and so we give you both an api and an interface that abstracts away all of the intricacies of the different systems delivering notifications getting them you know to uh... to uh... convert all that stuff so um... interesting part of what we do is that uh... we have it all integrated with the data layer so um... as opposed to other folks who segmented into a different service um, we let you do interesting stuff like send push notifications that are targeted based on data that you know about your own users so suppose you're a concert uh... uh... promoter you have a concert app you can do things like send a push notification to everyone who lives in Boston, who's over the age of 21, who likes one of these two apps. This is really powerful because we have both your data and the push system integrated in one place. So we also do everything around identity. So out of the box, you can drop in our SDK. We'll give you either social logins through Facebook or Twitter, or your own user management through username, password, email, and password, what have you. And the idea here is that this is stuff that just everyone built over and over again. It's just the table stakes that you need to get started. And we also give you the UI layer, if you'd like, so that you can just get to the important parts of your application. You can skin this thing. You can configure it to take Facebook, Twitter, what have you. We'll do all the cross-referencing. If you have folks logging in with Facebook and then associating the Twitter account, they can go to a different device, log in with Twitter. We'll know that they're the same person and do all the nitty-gritty there. <clears throat> so cloud code. Uh, this is sort of the uh, solution that gets you to uh, take care of the last 20%. The other stuff is all the table stakes functionality that's pretty common. Then cloud code uh, gives you a JavaScript environment to do all of the custom business logic stuff. Um, so you give us just a few snippets of JavaScript. Uh, you don't have to figure out the JVM. You don't have to figure out how to scale servers. You don't have to figure out how to index databases. You just write a little bit of JavaScript and then we execute this code on our back end. Uh, we've also done lots of first party sort of integrations with uh, folks like Twilio for sending text messages, uh, folks like Mailgun for sending emails. The idea here is that you should really not think about this sort of stuff and wherever we can, we don't want to re reinvent the wheel ourselves and not have you reinvent the wheel, so why don't we have a first party integration with uh, the best in class in certain verticals for certain services that folks uh, just need uh, time and time again. So uh, we've been around for a year and a half. We started in June of 2011. Uh, we've had 50,000 apps created on the platform. Uh, pretty happy about that. Uh, this we just recently calculated. Uh, Parse apps have been installed on uh, over 185 million uh, devices at this point. So that's pretty exciting. Some of our largest apps have 20 million installs uh, by themselves. Um, so definitely a lot of adoption. And so let me jump to sort of the, the topic at hand, which is the enterprise use cases that we're seeing uh, come onto Parse. And so they, they generally fall into these three categories. Um, so the agency-built consumer-facing apps, so these are, Mark touched on these, uh, the, a lot of these are sort of part of the CMO channel. These are folks uh, building uh, companions to their sports team, companions to their uh, retail stores, companions to... Um, their TV channels, whatever it may be, these are marketing initiated applications that typically serve a marketing goal or they are the equivalent of a website in the mobile world. Um, they're built by agencies, they're uh, built for large brands and typically um, <clears throat> you know, lots of dollars flowing through there. Uh, the consultancy built SMB apps 
are a lot more varied, and I'll talk about them a bit. Uh, but these are generally you know, small, medium-sized businesses who are just trying to enable some new workflow because mobile lets them do something more interesting that they couldn't do before. And then there's the traditional uh, IT-built enterprise apps uh, that are basically large enterprises trying to expose a mobile interface to some system that they might have had for a decade or two, or two already. So let me jump in here and talk a bit about the characteristics that we're seeing and, and what we sort of uh, think is interesting about these different types of apps. So the agency-built apps have lightweight data requirements typically. And what I mean by that is not that they don't have a lot of data, but typically the, the, the data model is pretty simple. Um, they're exposing some set of products. They're exposing some set of um, you know, user uh, data, or they're taking in user-generated content, whatever it may be. It's, it's not typically super complicated. Uh, what the complicated uh, part is is the traffic patterns. So uh, you can imagine that uh, a lot of these marketing-focused apps, they go from you know, a few folks developing it they launch, they go into the app store, no one really discovers them, and then all of a sudden there's a 30-second you know, ad on national TV that's telling people to download them. We've seen that time and time again, and that's really uh, part of the value that we provide to uh, our customers is that they don't have to think about the scaling part. Uh, <clears throat> another interesting part about agencies is that they're generally solving the not our expertise problem. So these are folks that are really good at building beautiful, engaging, fun iOS apps, Android apps, whatever they may be. They're not the people that want to be dealing with databases. They're not the people that want to be scaling them, maintaining them, whatever it may be. And so their deliverable to their end enterprise is the app. It's not, you know, I also built this great database. It, the, 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 the brand, the CMO, just wants to know that it'll work. Um, <clears throat> let me jump into some examples where you'll see that uh, push marketing and content management become really important. So uh, Tom's is on Parse. And so this is a pretty classic example of uh, <clears throat> what I would call uh, basically just a sort of brochureware. It's the, it's the website equivalent on, on mobile. And so they've got a style book. You can check out all the various latest Tom's and such. You can uh, buy some shoes. You can go to like, figure out where the closest retailer that sells Tom's is. Um, this is, you know, a very, very common use case, and I think increasingly we'll see more and more of these people. Every retailer needs to be on mobile, and as Mara alluded to, you know, they're always making this decision. Should we just expose an HTML5 website, or should we build uh, a native app for each of the platforms? And what we found is that, yes, they are choosing to build native apps. They produce better experiences. They produce an opportunity for us because we can abstract away a lot of the work uh, besides the nice UI layer that they do themselves. So the Food Network is also an app that's on a parse. I think Alex is in the uh, audience. He built it uh, with an agency called Sequence. And uh, this is a really interesting use case where they're taking a lot of user-generated content. Uh, it's flowing through parse. And they also need to do some con uh, content moderation, which is where the data browser content management system that we have comes in. So they have folks that take in, I think, user images. They have to moderate them. Uh, we've actually made that even easier recently with a, a partnership with a Crowdflower. So this is an interesting one where it's, it's a companion to their TV shows. It's just another um, channel for them to promote uh, what their real business is, which is pr producing content, right? So you can figure out where you know, your favorite chef's restaurants are. You can do all sorts of stuff. And I think increasingly, every show out there will be doing this. Uh, any person who produces content will need to get it onto the mobile channel, even if it's not necessarily showing videos. It's going to be getting folks to engage on the mobile channel. Uh, Sesame Street is another good example. So we're really excited about this one, or at least I am. Um, so Sesame Street and IDEO have built apps on Parse. And I think an interesting one here is, or an interesting thing to note here, is this is really a case of um, solving the not our expertise problem. Uh, it was built by IDEO, and they don't need any help building apps. They don't need any help with design. Uh, but they certainly don't want to be dealing with servers. They don't want to be dealing with scale. They don't want to be dealing with databases. Um, so when their co-founder goes on uh, 60 Minutes and talks about uh, Elmo calls and you know pumps it up and gets people to download it, uh, they look to us to scale their servers and deal with all the nitty-gritty stuff. 
And so uh, this is just common across the board. You know, this is a game in, in some sense. Uh, but in general, this is another case of folks uh, bringing content to the mobile channel. Uh, the last app I'll talk about is the Green Bay Packers. So they've built an app on Parse, and I think the idea here is that you can find where the games are next to you. So if you're traveling and you want to watch a Packers game and you're, you know, don't know where your favorite bar is, uh, you can go uh, figure it out. And it, it, this is an interesting use case because uh, location is really important here. Um, they're using uh, push targeting to figure out, like, hey, you might be traveling. You're out of town, but there's a Packers game on. We can send you a push notification uh, about where the game is playing, if there's some specials, whatever it may be. <clears throat> and so I think this is another trend that's happening. Uh, sports teams and others will be trying to get onto mobile uh, to keep their fans engaged, especially through the offseason. Uh, it's just another place to reach their fans. Uh, so SMB, the second part of the uh, three types, so there's much more variance in use cases. Uh, there's not a lot of sexy examples that I can show you. An example that you know is on parts that I can talk about is we have a chain of car washes in the Northeast, and they've uh, started using parts to uh, track uh, the cars that come in, who's washing them, how long it took to wash them, that kind of thing. And I think what's interesting about this use case and this sort of category of uh, applications is there the most likely to be enabling a brand new workflow. So this car wash in particular was using paper for this kind of stuff. Uh, there's you know, another example, a construction company used to use paper for uh, tracking like inventory, like how much copper they used on a construction site. Now they can use iPads because they weren't gonna truck around laptops, they weren't gonna truck around desktops. iPads are, are really the right form factor here. So these guys are, are the most likely to be enabling a brand new workflow. They've got a medium level of data complexity, but pretty light usage. If you think about a small to medium sized business, you know, maybe 100 employees, maybe a couple thousand, just a different order of magnitude uh, than, than the consumer side of things. Um, in terms of push notifications, they're much more likely to be using it for uh, real time communication and not just engagement or marketing purposes. So in the case of a construction company who's now doing inventory management on iPads, it's much more exciting for them to uh, you know, notify the people who need to know that the copper is running low than it is for them to you know, talk about the latest copper deals uh, for their uh, employees. So they have relatively straightforward out-of-the-box integrations, uh, minimal policy stuff to you know, deal with, minimal ongoing maintenance. They're typically uh, hiring uh, dev shops to do sort of fixes and, and improvements as time goes on. Uh, one interesting thing that we've seen is that they're able, pretty willing, and excited in some sense to mandate a particular platform. So, you know, for example, a car wash, they can say anyone using this new application has to be using this sort of iPad, you know, with the latest iOS, and they don't have to deal as much with the cross-platform uh, intricacies that, you know, a lot of the consumer guys have to deal with, uh, nor uh, the traditional enterprise guys. So they can say, everyone in this 100% organization, you have to use this iPad with this uh, set of software. Really, I'm gonna squeeze you on time just a little bit here. Okay, I've only got two slides left. Uh, so traditional enterprise stuff. Very traditional stuff, you know, HR, sales, field service tracking, very data heavy, much deeper integrations. They've got identity in Active Directory or LDAP. They've got data in SAP and Salesforce SQL Server. Uh, lots of, oops annoying, boring stuff like data retention policy, security compliance, policy-driven development. Lots of folks uh, whose job it is to cover their own asses and make sure that any data going in and out, uh, even to the mobile channel, is secure and compliant. Last slide. Uh, the interesting part here is that for them, uh, bring your own device is a huge problem. They want to be able to let their employees bring whatever device they want to the enterprise access any applications uh, that they're exposing uh, without carrying a specific extra work device. Uh, because if, if they're mandating an extra work device, you kind of lose a lot of the benefits of, uh, of the whole mobile thing. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. I'm Joe Pizzillo. I'm the co-founder of Push.io. And before I get started, I just want to take a moment to thank both uh, Tim and Bill. Tim and Bill's excellent adventure for putting this conference together. Round of applause if you haven't done that already. I mean, <laughs> incredible lineup of uh, speakers, incredible audience. And uh, our variation on the theme of the enterprises everywhere is actually to drill down a little bit on a concept we talk about that work is everywhere. So uh, there was just some talk now about uh, bring your own device. This has obviously created a lot of issues in enterprise and concerns about corporate policies and security and so on. But we think that the real implication is not so much that people are bringing their own device, but now that people are taking their work with them, that the boundaries of the classical enterprise have been broken. Uh, you're not expected, and obviously many of you who may be independent contractors or consultants or indies or otherwise are already well familiar with this. How many people here are actually working right now? There you go. So uh, part of what we see is the implication of the BYOD. The flip side of that coin is the fact that people, employees in particular, are now expected to work uh, whenever and wherever they are. Uh, quick background on me. I did the math. This is actually my 34th year of computing. I think there are probably some folks here that have me beat on that. I usually like to joke, although this is entirely true, my first computer was a Vax, although I only used it to play games. Um, I've worked for a variety of big companies, Apple and Wells Fargo being the two biggest. I spent uh, three years at Apple in the online services division during the dark ages. Uh, right at the beginning of the iPhone boom, I spent a couple years working for Wells Fargo on mobile, app, mobile apps for them. And then I have a whole separate experience on the flip side, the startup side of the fence, uh, uh, so I can relate to the, uh, the indie side of things as well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of stuff on my slides. I realize looking at the others, I put way too many words on the slides, and so let's just forget all of those. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of case studies from Push.io. So uh, Push.io in particular, we've been doing this since April 1st, 2009. We started the company literally two weeks after iOS 3.0 was introduced. We saw Apple introducing a business model where it was Apple, the devices, and then what they were calling your server. And we imagined rooms of people like this that are excellent at creating the client experiences, uh, but probably didn't want to do all of the work on building up, sta standing up, and otherwise building back-end services. You don't want to be plumbers. You're creating amazing UX experiences for users. We figured that was a great opportunity for us, and we decided to go with the push notification side of it, uh, in particular because that's something that we see that every single application out there is ultimately going to want. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, we've pretty much only worked for large enterprises. Uh, only within the last six months or so have we opened up our platform to all developers. We certainly encourage you to check it out at push.io. Uh, and also, kind of for context, we've now shipped more than 7 billion push notifications. Our uh, biggest day ever was Election Day this last year, where we did more than 200 million notifications for a single customer. Uh, I wanted to talk about a variety of different case studies, but really in the interest of time, we're going to talk about two, healthcare and retail. Let's jump right into retail. Uh, one of the, the, the case study I want to talk about here is something we did for a large national retailer, a pretty well-known name. Uh, they have more than 3,000 locations and more than 15,000 employees. And in particular, we built a solution for them that's focused on training, uh, mobile training in particular, and then also providing a kind of a key performance indicator dashboard so that the store managers, the regional managers, and the executives above them could all take a kind of, you know, at-a-glance view of how their stores and regions were doing and so on. Uh, it was very simple for uh, almost any employee in the company, or at least the relevant employees in the company, to be able to upload content, videos, documents, and so on. And the thing that we saw, and the key takeaway I want to provide for you, is that uh, most of this content was relatively short, so three to five minutes in length in terms of the videos and a couple pages in terms of the documents. And what really began to happen from our perspective was we saw them creating always-on employees. Uh, the employees were now expected to be able to perform their training work and otherwise do their work regardless of whether or not they were actually at work at the time. Uh, the short length of some of the videos made it so that in your quote-unquote downtime, you'd be able to do uh, some of this work and, and be able to catch up on what you were supposed to be doing for, for your uh, company. Uh, Tim may also be a little disappointed. He wanted me to talk a lot more about Passbook, but the other thing I'll say in general about retail is that Passbook has created some tremendous opportunities, uh, in particular because you don't have to have an application on the device. Now, uh, non-developers and, and, and companies and so on that don't necessarily want to have to go through the process of building any app whatsoever can begin to put content onto users' devices and have a channel uh, for interacting with them. So, Tim, there you go. That's my, that's my passbook paragraph. Um, Next example I want to talk about is healthcare, and also I should point out I'm going to talk as fast as humanly possible in the interest of time, so if you're not able to catch up, I'll be happy to do this again later. Um, but uh, 
in the in the healthcare example, we've done some work for a large, well-known healthcare provider, and there are kind of two key things I want to talk about with that. And the first is sort of what I'll call the patient relationship. And the patient relationship is sort of bi-directional. It's both from the care provider down to the patient, so doctors, nurses, and other specialists that need to be able to let a patient know, for example, while they're in the hospital that you know such and such treatment is coming up, or here are your lab results, and so on. But also from the patient out to their personal community, their friends and family, and, and personal caregivers, so that a patient doesn't and have that sense of isolation in the hospital, that they're able to reach out to family members and let them know that their x-rays were okay or their lab results came back fine and maybe their surgery got rescheduled and they can let people know and not have that sense of just being, you know, uh, an abandoned person in a, ho in a ho hotel bed, in a hospital bed, uh, uh, in a hospital somewhere. The flip side or the other example in this was uh, what we're calling kind of closest to care. Uh, and this is an example I'll use myself. Uh, I've got a son. Uh, I'm from Colorado. So my son's back in Colorado at school right now. Uh, God forbid the should happen, knock on wood, but let's say he's injured in a sporting accident at school. Well, I'm here in California, so there's no possible way for me to be the closest to care to help him out. So using location-based notifications and location-based data, uh, we can figure out that his mother is actually closer to him, and she should be the one to be notified uh, that she needs to go uh, help, help our son out. Um, and the key takeaway for this one is a kind of the reverse of the always-on employee. It's the fact that consumers or customers themselves, this may be patients, but you kind of have to think about them a little bit like customers, that the customers as well are always on and always connected. And part of what I think the enterprise is seeing is that historically they've created touch points or ways for the, commu the, the customer to interact with them, but now it's kind of the, the, to some degree the reverse, that the enterprise can now go to the customer because they've got a device with them at all times that allows them to have that channel and reach out to those customers. Now, all of this kind of leads up to, uh, I think, a little bit of what Brent was talking about, the idea of creating enterprise software that's disguised as uh, consumer software. And you may have seen a bunch of these acronyms before, business to business, business to consumer, et cetera. But what we've seen in practical experience is that these aren't actually silos, or at least they're not silos anymore. There's much more of a continuum, uh, and that the applications that you may be developing don't have to be thought of as simply a business to business application or an employee to employee application. There's actually a lot more of a continuum between these things than necessarily really particular like boundaries between what they should be. And I think there's tremendous opportunities for, for uh, developers uh, to be able to break through those, those classical boundaries and, and do things that are a lot more interesting uh, and do that. I also don't really want to do a sales pitch, but I do want to tell you a little bit about Push.io. People always ask us why you guys, I can go use StackMob and Parse to do push notifications, et cetera. Um, but there's really kind of two things. Some of it has to do with these features, but the other thing I'll say, and this is really particularly relevant, I think, to uh, developers here in the room, the thing that's really set us apart ultimately is our focus on customer service, the white glove, high touch, uh, premium level of service. We only have the premium lane at our company. We don't really have any kind of like, you know, the chattel variation that you get with the airlines or what have you. And I think that one of the areas where you as developers can really stand out is that level of high touch customer service. Companies in a growth mode working real hard to acquire market share and otherwise acquire customers frequently take their eyes off the ball in terms of, of the customer service that they provide. And if you continue to provide a focus for your customers, regardless of the size of the customer, although, as Brent pointed out, the money's at the high end, um, then you really have an opportunity to differentiate yourself and do something that uh, ultimately is very valuable to those customers. Remember that we talk about enterprises, but these are people too, right? They're actually, ultimately, we may be talking about working for an enterprise, but ultimately we're working for individuals within the enterprise, and they want to be able to have that kind of experience as well. Uh, heard a little bit about like table stakes features. So aside from these kind of features, we've definitely got all of the standard table stakes features of segmentation and location and one-to-one -one push and all that. But these four things have really worked for us very powerfully. Uh, first and foremost, we've got something we call audience logic. This allows you to apply Boolean logic to your segmented audiences. So you can do things. Uh, we do a lot of work in sports and broadcast. So you might, for example, want to be able to reach all of the fans of a particular team that are in a particular location, exactly like the Green Bay Packers uh, example there. Uh, and this would allow you to do that with very fine control using uh, and or not, et cetera, in terms of, uh, uh, of identifying those segments. Um, from day one, we've been doing something we call auto push, which is taking these data feeds. And uh, in the case of something like RSS, for example, if there's a new article in the RSS feed, we can let all the people interested in that feed know that there's a new article there. Uh, but it goes far beyond that in terms of the data that we've seen over the years. Uh, working, for example, in sports, we've had to deal with stuff like uh, scoring feeds that are based on typesetting systems. And certainly a ton of different, you know, uh, what I'll call bogus XML variations or extremely heavyweight XML types of things. Uh, and using our auto push capability, it's very, very simple to get new content pushed out. This is part of how we've gotten the 7 billion notifications is nobody has to sit down at a terminal and type in a message. It just gets sent out automatically. 
Now taking that to the next level, we have something we call data trackers. Uh, data trackers now allow you to apply uh, uh, variables and conditionals to those types of feeds as well. The example we talk about a lot is stocks, right? So you may be very interested in Apple stock price, but you don't necessarily want to get a notification or an update every single time the, the price changes. That would be overwhelming. But you do want to know if the stock goes below 500 or above 600, and that's exactly what data trackers do. It allows you to get a, a just very specific and, and granular control uh, based on conditionals and variables. We have some great examples out there right now in sports where uh, toward the end of a game, if the game is close enough that it could go either way, then we send out notifications to the fans of both teams and let them know, hey, score is close enough, your team may or, not win, may, or may not win, now's the time to tune in. Uh, the final example here, push conversions, uh, this takes it a little bit beyond. So you may know that when someone engages an application as the result of a push notification, we know that. But now we're also tying that to additional behaviors within the app so that, uh, for example, going to, back to the training example, uh, we know that a particular manager maybe has watched uh, one of three videos they're supposed to watch. We can now segment the, that user and let them know, you know, hey, if you don't watch the ethics video by Friday, you're going to have to see your HR rep and you're not going to get paid. Um, and this has been a very, very powerful feature for, uh, for our customers. <clears throat> All right, what does the future hold? So here's the way we see this in terms of these trends. The two trends we've been talking about here, one is uh, always on employees, and the second is the ever-connected customer. And we see, and you may already be very familiar with this, screens are no longer at desks, right? So we've now got employees that are expected to be always on and work wherever they are. Uh, this creates a much more fluid workforce that's not confined by the boundaries of a particular enterprise. Those people can work whenever and wherever they're at. I put verses here, but it's not really verses so much. It's really more like a coincident kind of trend, and that is that we've got customers in motion now as well, and we've got always-on customers and infinitely connected customers. And this is what allows the enterprise now to kind of both reach out to the customer wherever they may be, but also get that feedback closed uh, uh, whenever and wherever they are. Those were the trends I want to talk about. Thank you very much. Don't want to talk too much more. Thank you very much. And uh, please don't hesitate to be in touch. So we've gotten some questions over Twitter, but I want to start first with a question that has come up in the hallway, actually, already a couple times at this conference. Um, we have here uh, three companies, I think it's fair to say, that are in some sense back end as a service. Um, Push.io, StackMob, and Parse. So now that you're all kind of in a convenient group, um, can you specify exactly how your services are similar and different? And I think the most tangible way of doing this is just, if a developer is considering using your services, what kinds of apps would be sort of best to think about your service for, and what kinds of things do you clearly not do? So any order you want. I can start. The key thing that, uh, the key thing that differentiates us is that we don't offer anything for free. Um, all of our Good products point. are, well, this is, thank you very much. This is part of the history of working for Apple, right? I mean, it's like uh, the, the other co-founder and I are both ex-Apple folks, and we made a very conscious decision early on not to pursue a freemium model, but to go after a, a paid business, and that's uh, allowed us to be self-financed and grow for four years based on, exclusively on revenues. Uh, and otherwise, we only do push. So that's the other key differentiation. Good. Cool. Um, so we do offer a free version, uh, but we don't focus on monetizing that. So you're either paying us nothing or you're paying us 200 bucks, and we make most of our money on contracts that are in the thousands. So in, in that sense, I think we have best of both worlds. Um, as to the question of what sorts of apps are, are best on Parse and which ones aren't, I think a wide variety of apps fit on Parse. I think uh, you'd be hard pressed to find um, a niche that wasn't great for Parse. I think that if you're doing heavy data processing, for example, you're, you're doing machine learning or you're doing uh, heavy video transcoding and that kind of stuff, Parse is going to only solve parts of your problem, and you'll need to supplement it with other servers. That said, I think, by and large, we don't see a class of applications that couldn't benefit from Parse. Everything from uh, the consumer side uh, to the SMBs and to the enterprises where we offer uh, lots of connectors to internal uh, databases, which abstract away a lot of the uh, work from the actual mobile developers who can then work with something like an SAP or a Salesforce or an Oracle and not really worry about what exactly is on the back end. So, wide class. So, uh, I apparently missed the memo where there's sales pitches in the beginning of the speeches, but um, I didn't really talk much about stack do, model. Do, do one now. Um, <laughs> so, one, um, Push.io is not a competitor. Um, I've met Joe a bunch of times, um, trying to get him in the marketplace. I'm assuming he will be in the marketplace. Um, that's a big reason. 
uh, why we built the marketplace. You're not reliant on Snack Mob building everything and doing all those integrations. We provision accounts for you. You don't have to sign up for push IO on your own, manage that account. You sign up through Snack Mob. We provision an account for you. You have full access. You get one bill. You don't have to worry about SDK fatigue and all that other kind of stuff. Um, we do have a big free um, portion of our product, um, but that reason is because we work mostly with big enterprise um, in the enterprise platform and brand platform, so, um, and we're big believers in um, APIs should be free. Um, in terms of differentiation, um, a lot of things around easy management, so we're the only platform out there with development and production environments. Um, enterprise get more than just development and production. Um, API versions, so you can run concurrent versions of your production API um, at any one time with just a couple clicks of a button. And then um, our advanced custom code um, is, is been around for about three years, so if you do need to do image processing or video processing, you can do that. Um, you know, we've had people build genetic um, systems and platforms um, on StackMob. Thankfully, they're just virtual pets. Uh, but they are full breeding pets of where you can breed um, traits in and out. So, um, you know, there's really not, it's one of the great and horrible things about StackMob. There's no in particular area that we're, um, you know, spike in uh, because we're across the board. Um, but that's great because we can open it up and anything that we don't do um, that you'd like to do, you can write within custom code um, to give yourself that ability. Okay. Um, question for uh, Mar. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you had in your platform retailers and so on can edit their own catalogs and, and, uh, and content. You know, in the old days of the web, we always thought that would be a good idea. The client will edit their own stuff. It never seemed to sort of work out. How have you found that actually working out in your platform with the retailers? So far, so good. No. So, you know, it's actually relatively easy to do. We've been really focused on making that interface super easy to use. The people that use the platform, it's like I was saying, they're not iOS developers, they're really merchants. Typically, they're, it's their first job or maybe their second job, and they're more computer savvy. Maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, okay, people yeah. were afraid of computers. But today, pretty much all of them dragging and dropping and tagging or adding an animation, they probably learned it in high school or elementary school, my kids. So, you know, um, that's, that would be my answer. Okay, that makes sense. A uh, question uh, came through on Twitter for uh, Brent. Yes. Uh, why would only building apps for businesses be a rabbit hole? Did I say rabbit hole? You, apparently, you, it's in quotes. You said it. <laughs> rabbit hole. Does this work? Yeah, okay. Why would it be a rabbit hole? Building apps only for businesses. Because the, the rabbit hole you go down into or that I see happening is that businesses each one wants like some few things that the other ones aren't necessarily asking for. So if you're trying to build a, a great app that potentially everybody in the world might use, but you're building apps specifically for businesses and taking those little feature requests, you miss out on making that great app. You add you know, this one thing that they needed to get, to get that sale done, and then there's this other thing they needed, and then some other business needs a few things. So you just end up chasing those features and those sales, and you, and you totally miss the boat on making a great user experience and focusing on making something awesome that everybody might use. So how do you resist that pressure? Because of course it's easy to sort of mock enterprise software and think it's all overcomplicated and kind of a terrible interface and a ball of pain, but of course, I mean, business clients have a lot more leeway in terms of feature requests. How, sure. do, you, how do you balance that? Um, so far by just saying no. <laughs> A lot and arguing with people. <laughs> have you actually lost know. money by saying no? Or no, have you won no, the argument? but I will. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question off of Twitter here. Uh, this is a, more of a back end as a service question again. Risks and cautions in using multiple vendors. Uh, are there code and API conflicts between push IO, stack mob, parse? Are there any standards to resolve this? What do you say to people who are worried about th these collision issues? Um, great question. Uh, that, that's, again, one of the reasons why we launched the marketplace, um, because there's a lot of SDK fatigue and managing between them, getting updates. Um, we're trying to solve that problem with the marketplace. 
Um, so that's a big reason there, um, and provisioning um, users is a big part of that. Um, the other piece, I mean, I don't know, um, maybe Ilya could speak of anybody, but I don't know anybody who's using both of us. Um, that would be kind of weird. Would that <laughs> <ever happen? laughs> um, but I do know we have a ton of people using us in Urban Airship, us in SendGrid, us in Push, us in Accelerator. Um, so we have a pretty open platform, um, and the integration between services is, is pretty easy, so I don't think there's much of a conflict with us. Yeah, my answer is fairly similar. I think, you know, StackMob calls it a marketplace. We call it cloud modules. At the end of the day, you know, both platforms offer some core platform, and then they extend with third parties that are best in class for, you know, things like sending email or sending a text message, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, so our philosophy is pretty similar there. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we also cooperate with folks like Accelerator and PhoneGap and Sencha and anyone else doing sort of the UI level stuff, which I think is a whole, you know, other class of companies which are interesting and, and we cooperate with as well. So, uh, you know, fairly similar answer. Okay. I, I just want to add one thing um, that I forgot to mention. Um, with our marketplace, um, so say when Push.io gets in there, they're responsible for um, updates. So you're not relying on stack mom. So Push.io is going to know when they are going to change stuff. They don't have to coordinate with us and all the other developers. Um, they can run code within our custom code infrastructure and update it themselves. Um, so that helps a lot as well. well. My answer was going to be a little bit different, which is most of the apps we work with have more than a million users and are frequently developed by um, uh, agencies or app development shops or what have you. And uh, we see a lot more of our customers interested in what I'll actually call an a la carte solution. They're not necessarily looking for a uh, one-stop shop per se. They've already built out you know, a decade's worth of uh, user management with their website. And now what they want to do is integrate their existing user management that they've got on the website with their mobile app as opposed to kind of start over from scratch or otherwise use a, a third-party user management system. So we've actually found it to be an advantage that we're a singular kind of drop-in thing for uh, most of the apps that we do. Okay. Um, here's a question, I guess, I mean, Mark can probably start it, but anybody else can chime in. You talked about uh, upselling clients in some cases or brands on uh, native apps over HTML5. Uh, how, uh, how does that usually go, and what kinds of things do you tell them to sort of uh, make that case? <laughs> let, let, let's, let's reopen I this fight again one more time. I didn't say anything bad. Well, it's like I was saying, it's a little bit of a religion and um, it's hard to reason when it's religious. So, um, you know, I get, I'll give examples. Uh, in our case, you know, every, you almost play to what they want to hear. A CMO wants to hear they have loyal users and they want to bring up those loyal users because they create the most amount of money and sales for them, et cetera. So um, it's clear that if you, I actually tell people you should, you should pay money to your customers to download your app because you have a way to send them notifications, which, you know, it's much less polluted than getting emails at 7 a.m. in the morning. So, um, you know, that's something that works for them. If you're building an HTML5 app, it's really hard to get a push notification. So um, it's a really good thing. They, all, they are all about pushes, not necessarily mobile pushes, but just about pushes. So that's one thing that works for us. Also, like I said, you will compare you know, you can do really slick things on an app. I'll, I'll have, these are non-technical people. We walk sometimes to, you know, in New York and um, literally these are, I mean, we look like geniuses. <laughs> I'm not even an iOS developer, so. <laughs> but I'll say, listen, when you do an HTML5 app or any type of ASM web development, you're talking to the processor through the browser, so it's always not gonna be as good as if you're doing something native. And they kind of buy it as, Kind of what the the earlier the keynote speaker said, speaking you know explain it in simple terms that they understand, and most of them you know they see the success of their competitors. Like eBay, eBay's mobile apps have been downloaded over 120 million downloads, which is ridiculous. So they all aspire to be like, you know, their competitor. So it's you know it, you have to. There's always somebody in the room that is no no apps religious, but using different psychological arguments and technical arguments, you know, you can win them over. Well, actually, yeah, to broaden the question, I mean, you guys in the service businesses see a lot of apps going through. Is there actually a mini trend towards native now, like people are saying there is? 
sorry, can you say that again? Is there, in fact, a slight trend towards native apps the way that people are starting to say there is because of the Facebook transition and so on? Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Are, are you actually seeing that? I mean, definitely. I think the biggest argument people have against native apps is, you, you know, um, it's uh, somebody who doesn't have loyal users. So, for example, the average, some big e-commerce um, customers that we work with, the average number of times somebody visits their site over a year is once. Okay, only once. It's not every week or it's not every day, et cetera. Just think of how many websites do you visit on a regular basis, right? For those guys, you know, if you go regularly, clearly an app is so much better. There's no argument there, right? If you're going somewhere once a year, then your app has to do something ridiculously better, right. you know, and um, or different or whatever it is. So that's, you know. Yeah, Yuli, I think you're... Uh... Yeah, I was going to say, I think for us, um, you know, you asked, is there a trend from HTML5 yeah, to yeah. native? I think in e-commerce, there's a particular sort of, um, you know, anchor to HTML5. Um, but a lot of our bigger brands, when we talk to, um, you know, folks from Ferrari or Home Depot or the Green Bay Packers, um, you ask them, you know, what kind of apps do you like to use? And, and, and what do you, as a sort of your own consumer, want to be using? And it just, it's pretty clear that native wins in a lot of use cases. And you can do so much more, right? You can send a push notification based on location when you're you know, near a bar that's showing a game. Or um, you know, uh, Ferrari can show you know, real nice videos and cache them locally. Um, you just can't do a lot of stuff on HTML. And, uh, you know, and the engineer in me would love that, you know, the standardization of HTML to, to win over in, in the long term, maybe. But in the short term, for us, it works out just great because this is a pain point for folks, uh, the fragmentation of the different platforms, and in general, just the native apps win. I'd be happy to blaspheme both religions quickly, uh, and that is that uh, back in the day, uh, uh, doing a lot of the enterprise iPhone work, I did a, pre a whole sort of you know presentation around enterprise iPhone development, and one of the key things I would always point out is it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or, and there are a lot of examples where uh, there are native applications that are largely driven by HTML views uh, within the app. Uh, and I think the key thing, going back to kind of the enterprise development side of it, is what's your development strength? So if you're, uh, uh, just to pick an example out of thin air, if you're a big bank and you've got hundreds and hundreds of web developers, I mean, to replace that kind of development effort with hundreds and hundreds of native uh, mobile developers is just not practical in any kind of short-term ter time frame. So uh, why wouldn't you want to take the best of both worlds and have maybe more of a native wrapper, if you will, and then use the core strengths that you've got in HTML development to flesh out the inside? The reason not is, it, as has been explained, it's sort of like, you know, look how great Java worked out, right? And no offense to Java, but uh, in the end, it's like, you know, the promise of write once, run, run anywhere means that you're going to get a lowest common denominator app. And if you're okay with a lowest common denominator app, then God bless you and Godspeed to your development. But uh, that's ultimately the trade-off. Any uh, last thoughts on this? Well, I think one thing to say oh. is that some people are very well happy with a lowest common denominator app, and they can start there and move to native in, in the platforms that are working for them. And that's okay. I think that, you know, that's the lowest common denominator is not that bad, actually. So I think that both scenarios work out nicely for folks. Okay. Very diplomatic. Um, I think we're about out of time now. So uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.